All right, let's go ahead and get started. You guys can hear me, correct? Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Come, uh, thank you so much for coming here today for the practice uh, question review. We are going to do several questions, read the rationale together, think together, and practice this question in order for you guys to be a little bit more prepared for the upcoming HESI. Um, some tips and resources that I recommend uh, that you guys can do um, while studying for HESI is including Nexus Nursing. Uh, so this is a YouTube channel of a, a professor that she's uh, mainly just focus on doing practice questions and she has loads of video regarding message, uh, medical surgical and I thought it's really useful that um, you guys watch this video and try to answer the question before she say the answers and listen to her explanation um, and it's really helpful um, to listen to her and that's that is one of my favorite uh, resources throughout nursing school to watch and to come to uh, when I do practice questions because her questions are really good and it's not too boring not too dry when we just do it on the computer okay next is your best grade that this is the one that I uh, heard a lot of people using and I used it uh, during my message one. Um, you guys don't really need it. It's quite pricey, uh, but um, but yeah, it's another resources that people use as well to study for message. Uh, and then course point, course points of course is the one that you guys are having right now, I believe. And just do practice question on there. Um, next is quiz list. A lot of my friends said that um, they simply search message one has the uh, on Quizlet, and there's a lot of practice question on there, some that were even similar to the HESI that they took, uh, that they remembered. So that's another resources that we can uh, take a look at and do practice questions, and then think safety and priority. So for the HESI, I believe that you guys know the content already to this point, and I hope you guys know the content already. HESI is more about test taking strategy and how you prioritize prioritize and how you think um, when you do the question. So make sure that you guys only think about safety, think that in that scenario, you are a nurse, what will you do for that patient and uses the knowledge that you guys know about the disease and make the best judgment out of the answers. So with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and uh, start a few questions and then we, we see where we are right now, okay? All right, question number one, an overweight client is taking warfarin Coumadin, has dry skin due to decreased arterial blood flow. What should the nurse instruct the client to do? Select or apply. All right, let's, if you have your answer, just input it in the chat. Thank you. Please don't be afraid that we get right or wrong. Just do your best and um, and try. Yeah. Okay, so we have one, three, one, two, three. All right, so let's go ahead and analyze this question a little bit more. So this client is overweight, okay? So the client's taking warfarin. What is warfarin? Warfarin is an anticoagulant medication, right? Um, it is an anticoagulation medication. So when the patient is taking warfarin, they are at risk for bleeding, okay? and they has dry skin. So dry skin will even increase the risk for bleeding because if dry skin too, if too dry, it can break 
uh, the integrity and it can cause bleeding or injury to tissues. Uh, the patient also have decreased arterial blood flow. It's possibly meaning that the patient have uh, peripheral arterial, arterial disease as well, PAD, meaning that the blood is not perfusing their peripheral. So what should the nurse instruct the client to do? So the answer choices are one, two, three, and five. Good, uh, congratulations to who got correct. So let's look at question number one together, apply lanolin or petroleum jelly to intact skin. So, well, in nursing school, we learned that moisturizer, we should not apply moisturizer for the patient's skin because moisture can increase risk for pressure also wound, correct? But here is not moisturizer, this is petroleum jelly. Petroleum jelly is used uh, a lot in hospital for patients who have dry skin because it doesn't cause the moisture friction. Um, it's, 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 um, it's specifically used for dry skin and usually in the hospital to prevent um, the development of pressure, ulcer wounds and stuff like that. And uh, definitely we can use that to apply on intact skin. If this would have said moisturizer, then it will be a different story, right? So number one, correct. We want that. Next, follow a reduced calorie and reduced fat diet. That's correct too, because the patient has dry skin is also because of decreased arterial blood flow. And what is the main cause of arterial blood flow? Atherosclerosis, high cholesterol level. So reduce calorie and reduce fat, obviously, right? Number three, inspect the involved areas daily for new ulceration. So as a nurse, one way have to assess the patient, especially for someone who have an increased risk for skin, uh, skin um, uh, injury issues uh, because the patient have dry skin. And then use elect electric razor to save is also correct. So patient bleeding precaution, what is bleeding precaution? Bleeding precaution is meaning use soft bristle toothbrush and then use an electric razor to save, shave, okay? Electric razor is safer than regular razors, all right? so. If we, from this question, we learn about bleeding precaution, we learn about warfarin. Uh, so what is the antidote for warfarin, if anyone can tell me um, relating to this question? Antidote for warfarin. Vitamin K, correct. So when the patient is taking warfarin, we, the antidote is vitamin, vitamin K. If the therapeutic, the, the level of the warfarin in the blood is too high, then we have to administer the vitamin K for the patient because we don't want their um, PT iron ore level are too long, okay? So vitamin Ks are le green leafy vegetable. So when we give the patient warfarin, we have to teach them to not eat green leafy vegetable too, correct? So from only one question, we learn a lot of material. So that's how I want you guys to, to study, how I want you guys to learn when you guys do practice question, not just simply do the question and then um, go over it. We have to read the rationale. We have to relate other information relating to the, the question in order to, to study more in a, or to study more effectively. All right, so this is just the rationale. So you guys can read it later. I'll post this PowerPoint. Question number two, a client with peripheral vascular disease has undergone a right femoral popliteal bypass graft. The blood pressure has decreased from 124 over 80 to 94 over 62. What should a nurse assess first? All right, we have uh, some fours and some two. So let's read the question and analyze it, okay? The client with peripheral vascular disease, peripheral referring to arms, feet, legs. So vascular disease is relating to um, 
the circulation, right? This patient may not have adequate circulation perfusing the peripheral from their arms or their feet. And this patient has just undergone a right femoral popliteal bypass graft. So we know that the femoral area is a highly vasculated area. And if we have a surgery over that area, it can put the patient significantly at risk for bleeding. Um, so blood pressure has decreased from 124 over 80 to 94 over 62. Immediately think how hypotensive, that's one of the side of bleeding, right? Bleeding, one of the side is hypotensive and tachycardia. This patient just go through a surgery at a very highly vascular area and the blood pressure suddenly drops significantly. So what do we have to think? We have to think circulation. And when we look at the answer, we see pedoposis and capillary refill are referring to circulation. So now we have to read the question again. The question is talking about femoral popliteal bypass crap. Is that the lower body or the upper body? That's the lower body, correct? So capillary refill is can be checked on the arm and can be checked on the feet as well. But what is the more indicative of the um, the circulation, is it the poses or is it the, the nail bed? Some people, they have dark nail bed. We can't really assess their circulation there. And this patient is even have peripheral vascular disease. So their nail bed is maybe not even blanches when we, when we assess for them. So a more indicative, um, uh, a more, a better way, a best answer would be pedoposis, right? So this is the answer, pedoposis. So congratulations to who got it correct. So yeah, you guys can read the rationale later. Question number three, the nurse is caring for a client with peripheral artery disease who has recently been prescribed clopidorel plevix. The nurse understand that the more teaching is necessary when the client state which of the following. All right, we have uh, some threes and some fours. So let's read the question and look at the answer choices. So the nurse is caring for a client with peripheral arterial disease who has recently been prescribed with Plavix. So Plavix is a anticoagulant as well. So when we talk about anticoagulants, we ultimately think about how it can increase the patient risk for bleeding, right? So, I should not be surprised if I bruise easier or if my gums bleed a little when brushing my teeth. So that is an expected sign, right? Because when the patient brushing their teeth, their gums might bleed because they're taking anticoagulants. So that is expected. So that's not a wrong answer. We're looking for a wrong answer that needs further teaching. So second, it doesn't really matter if I take this medicine with or without food, whatever. So that's correct too, because the pl Plavix with or without meal, it does not affect the absorption of Plavix. So number three, I should stop taking Plavix if it makes me feel weak or dizzy. This is wrong because that is dizziness and weakness is not an adverse effect. It is side effect. We don't hold the medication because it is the patient experiencing side effects. We hold the medication if the patient experiencing adverse effect. So for example, 
certain medication uh, like um, interferon, um, that medication is used to treat cancer or uh, something like that. And um, the patient, the side effect is flu-like symptom, but the adverse effect is suicidal agitation. If the patient have a experienced side effect of flu-like symptom, we still continue to give the medication for the patient because the benefit outweighs the risk. But when the patient experiencing adverse effects such as suicidal agitation, that moment we have to hold the medication. So same here, Plavix. So Plavix, when the patient feels weak and dizzy, that is a side effect. So we do not stop the medication because of a side effect. So when the patient say, I should stop taking Plavix, if it makes me feel weak and dizzy, that is wrong, okay? And patients should never stop medication without consulting their healthcare provider in advance, all right? The doctor prescribed this medicine to make my plate less likely to stick together and to help prevent clots from forming. That is how Plavix work. It's how it, it, it's an anticoagulant. It makes the plate less likely to stick together and it's make the clot less likely to be formed and make the blood thinner. All right, you can, can read this later. Okay, question number four. The nurse is assessing the lower extremity of the client with peripheral vascular disease. During the assessment, the nurse should specify which of the following clinical manifestation of PVD. Select or apply. All right, we have two and four. So let's see if it's correct. Congratulations. So this is a theory-based questions, but also even if we haven't studied and, but we know that about per peripheral vascular disease, then we can kind of guess the answer, correct? So PVD is all about circulation that the peripheral is not getting perfused enough. So if a leg is not perfused good, it will not have a lot of hair. So a hairy legs, meaning they having good perfusion. Model skin or like the skin where it's blanches white, red, and mostly white. So that's model skin. And that is an indicative uh, uh, sign of um, PVD. Pink skin is good skin. Blue skin is not good. Coolness is they don't, when the blood flow through any area, it have the warm temperature to it. So if the patient have a coolness on their feet, that, it, that is a sign of PVD. Moist skin, moist is good. We want moisture. If the skin is dry, that means that it's not getting perfused good. So model skin and coolness are the sign, symptom, clinical manifestation of PVD. Good job, you guys. Okay, question number five. The, a client is admitted for dehydration and an intravenous infusion of normal saline at 125 ml per hour has, start, has been started. One hour after the IV initiation, the client begins screaming, I can't breathe. The nursing priority action is...
All right, I have answered choice two. Congratulations to who get it correct. So that is good critical thinking. Um, Hesse question, love to ask question like this. So a client admitted with dehydration, the patient is dehydrated and they have IV of NS at 125 ml per hour has already started. One hour after the IV initiation, the client begins screaming, I can't breathe. That means that this patient is maybe is experiencing fluid volume overload, right? Because there's so much fluid going into them uh, for some reason. So whenever there is some issues with breathing or the patient complaining of that they cannot breathe, the first thing that we want to do is to help facilitate them to breathe easier before we do anything else. And elevating the head of the bed is the most basic but most critical action that a nurse can do in order to um, help the patient to breathe. Usually when do we discontinue the IV site? That is when the patient experiencing anaphylactic reaction or the patient experiencing a, um, a reaction to the medication, uh, an allergic response to the medication, that's when we discontinue the IV side, or the, the patient might have infiltration of phlebitis, meaning that the vein uh, is leak, the, the fluid is leakage outside the vein. That's when we discontinue the IV side and contact the primary healthcare provider. But in this case, the patient is currently cannot breathe. So the first priority questions answer that we pick is have to be how to help them breathe easier. And before we contact provider, we always need a sign of vital sign. Whenever we call the doctor, we need to have all the information ready. And they're going to always ask, what is the patient current vital sign? And with that vital sign, the, the doctor will hang up on you guys and they will not talk to you guys because there's not enough information. So it's always important to know that, okay? Good job. Next question. A nurse is assessing a client with a diagnosis of early left ventricular heart failure. Specific to this type of heart failure, the nurse expects the client to state. All right, awesome, you guys. So I have trouble breathing when I walk rapidly is the correct answer. Because this patient have left sided heart failure and when the left side heart failure is not pumping good enough the blood is backed up into where into the pulmonary vein and the pulmonary vein will go back into the lungs so that is why the patient will have fluid back up into the lung and causes trouble breathing and especially when they walk rapidly as well so this is the um to specific to the type of left-sided heart failure. So good job. Next questions. The nurse is providing teaching to a client with atrial flutter who has received a prescription for an oral anticoagulant. The client asks the nurse to provide a list of foods that are high in vitamin K and that should be avoided. What should the nurse include on the list? All right. Nutrition question always come up, you guys. There will always be at least one question in the HESI about nutrition, I can guarantee. All right, we have one and three, so let's see what's the answer. Correct. So earlier I mentioned that vitamin K is a green leafy vegetable. So that's, that's spinach and broccoli, super green, right? So those are really high in potassium. So with nutrition, we just have to learn, you guys. So know your vitamin K, know your potassium, know your iron, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Know your protein, know your carb, know your saturated fat, know your unsaturated fat, 
that's pretty much it. Know the latex, latex associated nutrition. So patients who are allergic to um, bananas or kiwi, those patients usually allergic to latex as well. So those are some more of the nutrition that we need to know. And also shellfish and iodine, okay? So here, spinach and broccoli are high in vitamin K. And if the patient is taking warfarin, we don't want the patient to eat more vitamin K because it will decrease the effectiveness of the medication. Orange and sweet potato are high in what? Potassium. Orange and sweet potato are high in potassium. And when do we give pot potassium for patient? We give it to patient who take furosemide, LASIK, the medication, the diuretic medication when they try make the patient pee, all the pee out and decrease their potassium level. So that is when we need to recommend the patient to eat more oranges and sweet potatoes. But the chicken breast high in protein. And when do we need protein? Patient um, experiencing burn, patient who need uh, promote wound healing, then chicken breast will be a good choice. Next question, a client with a productive cough has obtained a sputum specimen for culture as instructed. What is the best initial nursing action? All right, we have B. You guys are doing amazing. So when we have a sputum specimen of a culture, the best initial nursing action, the first nursing action that we should do is observe for the color, consistency, and amount of sputum because we want this information to see and assess that whether the patient is actually having a infection. So if the color is green, yellow, and they have a um, odor to it, a uh, purulent drainage or a, a, a foul or sour odor, then that means that this patient may have, may be infected or they have an infection. We never administered the first dose of antibiotic before we know the specific culture of the bacteria. We will administer a broad spectrum antibiotic after we collect the sputum, but we don't um, administer a specific antibiotic to a patient who, when we do not know what is what kind of bacteria uh, they, they have. Um, so that's why A is incorrect. We encourage Encourage the client to consume plenty of warm fluid is, a, is, is fine. It's nothing wrong with that. However, it would not be the best initial nursing action to do at the moment. And send the specimen to lab for analysis is going to be after we observe for the color and all of that. Next question, an older adult woman with a long history of COPD is admitted with progressive shortness of breath and persistent cough. She's anxious and is complaining of dry mouth. Which intervention should the nurse implement? All right, you guys are awesome. So assist her to an upright position. This is the first best simple but critical action that the nurse can do for anybody who complaining of breathing issues or anxiety or shortness of breath. Because that's the first thing that we can do. Then we can apply a venturi mask. We can encourage the patient to drink water, to thin out all of those mucus, and we can administer a prescribed sedative. It's very invasive. We don't go for that medication unless we have no other choices, okay? All right, next question. A client who weighs 175 pounds is receiving IV bolus dose of heparin, 80 units per kilogram. The heparin is available in two ml vial labeled 10,000 units per ml. How many ml should the nurse administer? All right round to the nearest 10th. 
Okay, you guys do it. All right, we have 0 0.6, so let's see. Congratulations, you guys. So 0 0.6 is the correct answer. So when we do this, we have to convert pounds into kilogram, 175 divided by 2.2, then we get the kilogram, then we times it with 80 units. And then we the heparin is available in two ml, labeled 10,000 units per ml. And the question asks how many ml should the nurse administer? Then we have to um, to place it uh, ml equal uh, one ml over ten thousand. And then yeah, you guys just use the unit that you guys tam with. I I need to write it out, but yeah, if you guys don't know how to do this, um, please reach out to me and I can help you guys with dosage calculation. Okay, but the correct answer is 0 0.6. All right, next question. A client with carcinoma of the lung is complaining of weakness and has a serum sodium level of 117. All right, which nursing problem should the nurse include in the client's plan of care? All right, we have C, so let's see. All right, congratulations, so C. C is the correct answer. So the patient is having a sodium level 117. 117 is hyponatremia. So let me tell you guys this, whenever someone have hyponatremia, they automatically have fluid volume access. Whenever who have hypernatremia, meaning more than 145, then they have dehydration okay because when we don't have enough sodium in our body the um when we have low sodium in the body it causes fluid volume access it causes the water um because it's too much water in the body that's why the the sodium level is decreasing you know what i mean so that's why they are uh fluid volume access So just remember that hyponatremia is associated with fluid volume access and hypernatremia is associated with um, dehydration. Next, a female client enters the clinic and insists on being seen. She's weak, nervous, and reports a racing heartbeat and recent weight loss of 15 pounds. After ruling out substance withdrawal, the healthcare provider suspect hyperthyroidism and admits her for further testing. Which action should a nurse implement?
Thank you. Um, so B is the correct answer. Space decline care to provide peer reverse is the correct answer. So the patient clearly showing sign of symptom of they are having hyperthyroidism, meaning they metabolize everything super fast. They, heat, they have heat intolerance, they weak nervous, and they have a racing heartbeat and even weight loss. So all of these pulling to the, the, the point of that the patient is having hyperthyroidism. And when someone have hyperthyroidism, we want them to rest. We don't want them to exert more exercise or doing more activity because that even increases the faster metabolism and that's not good for the body uh, or their health. So that's why spacing the client cares to provide rest period is the best answer here. We, the reason why beginning preparing the client for thyroidectomy, even though thyroidectomy, removing of the thyroid is one of the treatment for hypothyroidism, but that is too invasive. We don't when we do HESI question, we have to pick something that the least invasive most before we can go into something else too invasive, like having a thyroidectomy. They will have hyperactive sounds, but that is not addressing the question that the, um, that not addressing the, the question, uh, the part that the question is asking and provide warm blanket to prevent heat loss is incorrect because these patients have heat intolerance. So we don't even give them blanket because they, they cannot tolerate heat. All right, next question. The nurse is teaching a client with glomerulonephritis about self-care, which dietary recommendations should the nurse encourage the client to follow? Awesome, so we have B, restrict protein intake by limiting meat and other high protein foods. So that is absolutely correct. When someone who have glomerulonephritis, um, they, um, they have issue with the kidney, correct? And whenever an issue with the kidney, protein is a very big molecules. And when the kidney is the, 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 the organ that it filters the protein. So these big molecule, going through the kidney and the kidneys is already in glomerulonephritis. They already have an injury. They already damaging, already damaged. And we continue to eat, eat more of protein then it can cause worsen the, the issues of the patient. So restricting protein and decreased protein intake is, uh, is one of the uh, diet restriction that we implement for these patients who, who are um, having issue with the kidneys. All right, limit oral fluid intake. No, we, we, we don't need to do that. Increase intake of high fiber food, that's always a good thing. And increase intake of potassium rich food, such as banana um, is, 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 not, is not a good thing because the patient is already in having a kidney injury and we don't want to increase potassium food because um, the kidney have to filter the potassium too. We want to decrease the work that the kidney has to work. We don't want them to overwork. So that's why we don't increase the intake of potassium food. All right, let's move on. Question number 14, an overweight young adult, ma young adult male who was recently diagnosed with type two diabetes mellitus is, made, is admitted for a hernia repair. He tells the nurse that he's feeling very weak and jittery which action should a nurse implement? Select or apply. All right, we have ABC, check his finger stick glucose level, assess his skin temperature, and measure his pulse and blood pressure. So let's see. Awesome. You guys are on fire. You guys are going to ace the HESI for sure. 
Um, so yes, the patient is experiencing weak and jittery. So these are classic sign symptoms of hypoglycemia, um, weak and jittery, uh, cold and clammy. So those are signs of hypoglycemia. Whenever someone in hyperglycemia, they will be like a hot and dry. So weak and jittery. So the first thing when we suspect someone having hypoglycemia is to do a finger stick, of course, to check the blood glucose level. And um, we assess their skin temperature because if it's hot and dry, then it'll be like hyperglycemia, right? Uh, temperature, assess skin temperature and moisture because uh, we, see, we want to see that if they are cold or clammy, and obviously measure his pulse and blood pressure uh, as vital sign uh, to because the patient is uh, suspect uh, is complaining of being weak. All right, we don't document anxiety on the surgical ch checklist. We don't administer PRN dose of regular insulin with that if when we suspect the patient is having um, hypoglycemic episode because we don't want to further decrease that blood sugar. Next question, number 15. A client has a history of hypothyroidism, was initially admitted with lethargy and confusion. Which addition fighting warrants the most immediate actions by the nurse? All right, let's see. Correct further decline in level of consciousness. So a client who having history of hypothyroidism, so hypothyroidism are slow metabolism, they are sleepy, they are gaining a lot of weight and they metabolize very slow. They have cold intolerance, all right? So they are lethargy and also confusion. Which addition find warrants the most immediate action by nurse is further decline in level of consciousness. This patient is going to have a mixed edema coma, which is the toxic, uh, uh, mo this most severe um, type of hypothyroidism. So that is why that it warrants the most immediate action by the nurse because level of consciousness is really important to assess because it can come with a lot of different issues. Facial puffiness and periodal edema that is kind of expected right because they are slow metabolism they're usually obese and they usually um overweight hematocrit of 30 percent that's not too bad that's not like too crazily low so that's in kind of like an accepted range right cold and dry skin these are sign expected sign symptom of hypothyroidism so that's why a decline in level of consciousness is a change an, a bad change. That's why that it required the most immediate action by the nurse. Next question. Following surgical repair of the bladder, a female client is being discharged from the hospital to home with an indwelling urinary catheter. Which instruction is most important for the nurse to provide to this client? C. So C, keep the drainage back lower than the level of the bladder. So let's see if it's correct. Perfect. So the correct answer is C, keep the drainage back lower than the level of the bladder. And that is the most important for the nurse to provide for this patient. So let's look at question number A, avoid calling up the tubing and keep it free of kink. So yes, that is correct too. But what is the best? So we have to read more. Cleanse the perineal area with soap and water twice daily. Okay. Drink 1,000 milliliter of fluid daily to irrigate the catheter. Usually we want to drink 2,000 um, ml fluid. Okay. So keep the drainage back lower than the level of, of the bladder is going to be the most important. The reason is because if the back is kept 
higher than the bladder, then the fluid is not being flow to the back because of gravity and it come back to the, 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 the bladder and it defeated the purpose of the urinary catheter. And also it causes an increased risk for infection, right? Because the urine is staying there in the bladder instead of getting out of it. And urines are really acidic and they are high in bacteria as well. So they, are, they can cause infections as well. So C is the most important for the nurse to provide to this client. Question number 17, when caring for a client with nephrotic syndrome, which assessment is the most important for the nurse to obtain? All right, we have A. So let's see if it's correct. All right, awesome. So whenever someone who has a nephrotic syndrome, this patient, um, the level of albumin is being secreted outside of the vascular um, system. So it's, not, it's no longer inside the blood vessel anymore. It's, it's being outside in the, uh, the um, uh, extra, extracellular fluid. So whenever the albumin goes anywhere, water also follows it. So if the, the so these patients usually get really edematous and swelling and, and they retain a lot of water because they're in nephrotic syndrome as well. The kidney doesn't produce any more urine, so they retain a lot of water. So for that reason, um, their fluctuation in weight, um, they have fluctuation in weight. So we have to daily weight the patient in order to make sure that the patient is not increased the weights too significantly, uh, which mean that the patient retaining too much water or fluid inside the body, and that can be a concern. Uh, so that's why um, daily weight is uh, the most important assessment for the nurse to obtain. And also it's the most reliable method, reliable um, assessment uh, for someone who have kidney issues like nephrotic syndrome, glomerulonephritis, or acute kidney injury, am I right? Vital signs of consciousness bowel cells are important too, but they compared to daily weight, it is not specifically associated with nephrotic syndrome. Next question. A female client who was involved in a motor vehicle collision is admitted with a fractured left femur, which is immobilized using a fractured traction splint in the preparation for an open reduction internal fixation. The nurse determines that her distal poles are diminished in the left foot. Which intervention should the nurse implement? All right, we have B, C, and D. So verify pedal poses using a Doppler pose divine. Sounds good. Monitor left leg for pain, paler parathesis and paralysis. Sounds good. And D is evaluate the application of the splint to the leg. To the leg. All right, let's see what the answer choices are. Awesome, you guys are absolutely correct. So first of all, Offered eye chips and oral click liquids is not related to the questions, to what the question is asking. The question is about distal pulses and diminished in the left, and how is it diminished in the left foot? And that is about circulation, right? So offer eye chip and oral clear liquid that will be related to dehydration. Administer oral antispasmodic and narcotic analgesis is too invasive and is not related to what the question is asking either. So BCDs are the correct answer. We want to verify pedal poses because we want to make sure that the patient peripheral foot and, uh, feet and arms, legs are being perfused. We want to assess for pain, the six Ps, 
pain, paler, parathesia, paralysis, and pressures. These are six, the 6P six uh, sign of compartment syndrome. So we have to make sure that these, the patient does not have any sign of this. And then evaluate application of the splint. Is it too tight or is it causing a lot of um, issues for the patient? Then we can call the doctor after we have all these informations. So these are what intervention that the nurse can implement if someone who who, who have a splint and their pulses are diminished. Next, a client with Addison disease started taking hydrocortisone in a divided daily dose last week. It is most important for the nurse to monitor which serum laboratory value. All right, I have B. So that is absolutely correct. So glucose is really important to be checked when someone who on hydrocortisone, which also known as steroids. Steroids increases the blood sugars, it's mass the infection, so it can also, and it's also immunosuppression, so it increases the patient risk for infection, and it also increases the patient risk for bone fragile, so osteoporosis. So I want you guys to remember that, okay? So we have to check for glucose level for someone who is taking steroid. Any medication and in zone, S-O-N-E, those are usually steroids. So we have to make sure that we, I mean, we check the glucose level, make sure that it's not too high. And if it's too high, we then have to talk to the doctor and get a prescription of insulin, okay? So glucose is the most critical lab uh, out of these four that is related to uh, someone steroid, taking steroid. Next question, number 20. A client admitted to a surgical unit is being evaluated for an intestinal obstruction. The healthcare provider prescribed a nasal gastric tube, anti-tube to be inserted and placed to an admitment low wall suction. Which intervention should the nurse implement to facilitate proper tube placement? All right, I have D. Absolutely correct, you guys. So elevated the head of the bed, 60 to 90 degrees is very important when we administer the NG tube, right? Because if, you get, if we remember it from fundamental, when we administer the NG tube, we want the patient to take a sip of water and swallow so that we can put the NG tube down into their stomach. We don't want the NG tube go into the trachea, into the lung, because that is wrong. We don't want to administer food into the lung. That is no, 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 that is aspiration. So that is uh, elevated the head of the bed will be the best uh, for when we, um, when we administer an NG tube. And also we want it to be, uh, the NG tube is to in the minimum low wall suction because NG tube, instead of giving food for the patient through the NG tube, we can also decompress. We also get the stomach uh, stuff out of the stomach um, so that the patient bowel can rest or we, in certain cases when the patient is OD or taking a lot of medications uh, for suicide, then we have to decompress the stomach in order to get all of those medication out. So that is uh, why um, NG tube are used at, put at intermittent low wall suction. Um, we never apply suction Y insert in the tube. That is correct. That is absolutely wrong. We only um, apply suction when we, we're withdrawing the tube, okay? Insert tube with the client head till back. No, the client chin have to touch the, the chest and that will be better, the best because that, that is meaning that we, they're closing the trachea so that the tube can go into the esophagus instead of the trachea. We don't soak the nasal gastric tube in warm water. 
only sterile, uh, only um, the, the nasal normal saline. All right, last questions. A healthcare provider with no known exposure to tuberculosis has received a Mantox tuberculosis skin test. The nurse assessment of the test after 62 hours indicate five millimeters of erythema without induration. What is the best initial nursing action? All right, I have A, so let's see if it's correct. So A is an absolute correct answer, good job. So let's read this question. So Mantox tuberculosis skin test is a, is a test that we've all done, right? We, we went to the health center and we've done, they inject something into our arm. And after three, three days, we come back and then they assess us whether it's uh, is um, inflamed, is it big or it's not? So we learn about the um, 15 milliliter, 10 milliliter and five milliliter. So for healthcare provider, um, if anything is bigger than 10 milliliter, um, then it means that we may have been exposed to TB. In this case, the, it's only five milliliter. So it's smaller than 10 milliliter. So that's why it's a negative result. However, if this, the patient have five millimeter and they are immune, immunosuppressed, they are chemo patients or HIV patient, then it, it will be a different story. It will be a positive result. That will be, then we will have to refer the patient to a chest x-ray procedure to screen and to find out furthermore if whether they have TB or they have only been exposed to TB. So you guys what, know what I mean? So if it's a regular person, anything bigger than 50 milliliter, then that means that they have a positive result, meaning that they may have been exposed to TB. So if it's a 12 milliliter, for example, for a regular human, for a regular person, not in healthcare, not HIV, regular, and it's 12 milliliter, that is mean that they have a negative result because it's less than 15 milliliter. But for a healthcare provider, 12 milliliter meaning a positive result because for healthcare provider, the skin test is only 10, okay? So anything more than 10 for a healthcare worker or for someone who stay in the, um, the, um, the place where, where they put elderly patients like long-term care facility, those, if it's more than 10, then that, those, they, they are uh, having a positive result, okay? So... Was that make sense for you guys today? Was this helpful at all? Yes, okay, thank you. Well, there are some more questions, but um, because I'm out of time, it's been already one hour. Um, so I'm going to post this on the YouTube so you guys can rewatch it or for people who have not had the chance to watch it but I will post this PowerPoint for you guys. There's about nine more questions left in the PowerPoint so you guys can, 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 can do it, okay? Yes, we will be doing this again next Tuesday and it will be different questions. Um, but is that okay with you guys? Do you guys want to do this or do you guys want to go over something else? You're very welcome. So there's nine more questions left in this uh, PowerPoint, okay? So make sure you guys go back uh, to go back to the PowerPoint and finish nine of that question. You're very welcome. I hope you guys had a good time and you guys are doing amazing. You guys are gonna be acing the HESI for sure. I have no doubt. Okay, with that being said, I'm going to uh, stop the session right now. Uh, feel free to leave. Thank you everyone for coming today.